Beverly Reed. And I'm Dr. Amber Klimczak. And we are Two, Two Peaks, Peaks in a Pod. Pod. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are both dressed up today. Yes. It's we, a special occasion. That's right. Tell them what we're doing tonight. We have our first peak annual holiday party Yay. this evening. So we're really excited. <laughs> Such a fun thing. And I just love, we we have a special surprise for our employees. We're going to be surprising them with a holiday bonus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have been working so hard. Right yes. The clock. We've been really busy. So they definitely deserve a little something extra. Yes. It's so fun to get to spoil them a little bit. So, and they don't have any idea it's coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I wanted to tell you about a social media article that's been kind of making the rounds over the last week. So we're going to be talking about Paris Hilton, and we have talked to her about her before because if you remember, Kim Kardashian had taught um, Paris Hilton about IVF, <laughs> and um, Paris Hilton had made a comment saying that you can pick to have twins. So we had discussed whether that's really true and all that on a different episode. But now I just wanted to kind of bring it back up because now she's sharing more about using a surrogate um, and maybe the possible reasons behind that. So I don't know if you kind of know the background about, what, about what's going on, but with Paris and her husband, they did not tell anybody that they were having a baby. Oh. So not even her own mother. Oh, so Paris, I guess you can do that with her again, right? Like <laughs> Paris literally brings the baby to her mother, oh and and is like surprise. Okay, that would make, that would make for some really great reality television. Was this on her show? Yes, okay, yes. Okay, and um, it is actually very interesting interaction mm -hmm. because I mean the mother is stunned, <laughs> crying, yeah, but also really hurt. Yeah. Because she was like, I'm your mother. How yeah. can you not tell me as your mother? And it looked, I mean, you think it was real? Like, you think she really didn't tell Yeah. Her? Oh, yeah. Like, it was For obvious sure. from her mom's mm -hmm. reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And so Paris actually has two kids now. So that's what she did for her mm -hmm. first one. And then she just had her second one now. Okay. She did do the same thing again where she didn't tell anybody, except this time she did tell her mom and her sister. She told those two people. But besides that, she kept it totally a secret from everybody and really made the announcement with, here she is. Here's oh, my baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what is her motivation behind such secrecy? Yes. Well, I think this is a good point. She really just pointed out how she just is under the microscope mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. She's always in the media and in these news articles. And a lot of times people are very critical of her. And so I think she just felt like I don't get to keep any secrets. This is my little secret that, that mm -hmm. I want to keep and, and surprise it. the world with. Um, and again, when you're using a surrogate, you can do that. But I know as a fertility doctor, whenever I hear about celebrity fertility stories, I kind of want to know more. And even though it's none of my business, I was curious, why did she need to have a surrogate? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting. I'm seeing a couple of different things. The very first article that I saw was her sharing that the reason she wanted to use a surrogate was that she she needed to be able to hide it. She didn't want the world to know. Now, there is mm -hmm. going to be more that I'm going to add that I found out for later. But just mm -hmm. kind of seeing that first reason, I don't know. How does that feel when you hear about that. I'm just like, is that is that a good reason to use a surrogate? <laughs> I would say certainly not a medical indication. Yeah. You know, we use we call them gestational carriers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes surrogates are gestational carriers for reasons that we think our patient could not carry a child themselves. And we tend to have guidelines for that. The desire to not want the world to know you're pregnant is certainly not a medical yeah. <laughs> not in our medical guidelines. So I would say that's um that's an interesting reason. You know, and I mean, I so I definitely sort of questioned it in my mm -hmm. own head. Mm -hmm. And we kind of thought about this before, too, when it came to the other issue of her saying she could pick twins. Mm -hmm. Does Paris Hilton get special treatment, right? Because if we had a patient that came in and said, well, the only reason I want to use a surrogate is I don't want other people to know I'm pregnant, we would decline her, as I feel like mm -hmm. most um, fertility doctors would do. And so then I'm like, but why does she get special treatment where she's allowed to do that? Is because she's rich and famous? And, you right. know, mm -hmm. and I think, too, it's so hard because surrogates are hard to find. Even if somebody has the resources to pay for the process in the surrogate, even so, sometimes there's waiting lists or you need to find. And so it's kind of like, is that really fair that somebody who could be a surrogate is being used in, for this reason when maybe there's other more legitimate reasons to use one? But Right. Or even maybe like 
pushing the cost of surrogacy mm-hmm. even higher, higher, sure. higher for the yeah. people that it already feels really out of reach for. I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. surrogacy is very expensive mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. something that we should maybe even discuss. Yeah. It can be really pricey. And sure. so it's, for most people, I think the obvious reason why they wouldn't just choose a gestational carrier or a surrogate because they don't want people to know they're pregnant is that they can't just afford to do that mm-hmm. for that reason alone. They're really doing it. No, I don't want to say out of desperation, but out of like, that's the last resort. You yeah. know, you have to use a surrogate because it's the, your only option. Yeah. But I think certainly if you have a lot of means and, you know, money, mm-hmm. then you can pay someone to do that. Probably a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's hard because I will admit that's a little bit of my judgy self. Mm-hmm. And again, none of my business, but too, when you look at all these celebrities, look at this small group of people. So Paris Hilton and Kim Kardashian and Khloe Kardashian, who've all used surrogates. Right. Mm-hmm. And I know with Kim and Chloe, I think they both said that they had medical reasons to do so. Um, Kim has said what her medical reason was. Chloe, we don't really know exactly, but they've said it's a medical reason. But it just ma- does make it seem like, is it that common? You know, and, mm-hmm. and you can't help but kind of wonder, are there other reasons that, that they want to use a surrogate? But I will say it did seem like maybe that article or the little snippet I saw about that being the reason may not have been the whole story mm-hmm. because I did see an article that just came out yesterday where she really um, opened up more about her PTSD and severe anxiety when it came to potentially being pregnant and having a baby. She did have a really rough time apparently growing up. Um, I think she just wrote a book and I haven't read it yet, but really kind of describes some very traumatic circumstances. I think she was raped. She um, had been put in a boarding school where she suffered some sort of abuse and everything. And because of those traumatic experiences, she, I guess when she thought about being pregnant or giving birth, um, would get very, very anxious and and all of that. And so I wanted to get your take on that. Do you think that is a more legitimate reason to use a gestational carrier? I can say I've actually never had someone use a gestational carrier for that reason. Um, And maybe that's just, I have never been approached for that, Mm -hmm. but perhaps maybe more, I mean, I think mental illness is a mm-hmm. disease. It is yeah. a medical reason. So I think, mm-hmm. yeah, it's probably a little bit more legitimate uh, yeah. idea as to why someone might need to use a gestational care. Certainly not in my realm that I've seen on a regular basis or mm-hmm. heard of people using it before. But yeah, I mean, I do believe that mental illness yeah. is a medical reason. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's certainly a more reasonable um, thing to do. But also, I think probably primary interventions that we would would have wanted to help and offer with is counseling mm-hmm. and therapy to also just really help somebody sort through those feelings and see, you know, hey, is there a way to really just help comfort you through the process and make it feel like a safe process and, and all of these things um, instead of, you know, going straight to surrogate? I don't know if those things were, you know, offered to her. Hopefully they were at the time, but um, probably the approach we would have used would maybe use it as a last resort after trying, you know, maybe some other things first. Right. Um, Okay. So I went to talk about a couple different things then when it comes to using a gestational carrier. So first I do think we should talk about what are all the different reasons that somebody might need a gestational carrier. I know you mentioned a couple of them. Yeah. So I would say it kind of falls into you know, you, the patient, mm-hmm. already have pre-existing medical conditions that maybe make it unsafe for you mm-hmm. to carry a baby, and we can talk about the list of those. Mm-hmm. And then there's also things that you may not find out about until you're actually going through fertility treatment, and you have tried to get pregnant with your uterus, and mm-hmm. things are just not going well. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something going on with your uterus, mm-hmm. your environment, and you're not able to get pregnant with your own uterus. So some things you may already know exist and are happening to you, and some things you may find out after going through fertility treatment. Um, but I would say probably first talking about medical conditions, mm-hmm. so things that I've you know seen people use gestational carriers for mm-hmm. were very severe, you know, kidney diseases mm-hmm. where we know that their kidneys are just not stable enough to support a pregnancy. Heart conditions can also be that way if you're gonna put too much stress on the heart or other underlying um, you know, heart conditions, arrhythmias, things like that that we know about going mm-hmm. into. Um, congestive heart failure, that sort of mm-hmm. stuff where you can't get someone pregnant because mm-hmm. they would really put their health at risk. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I would say kidneys, heart, um, weight, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. could be a reason, obesity, mm-hmm. 
What are some of the other big ones for medical yeah, conditions? Yeah, um, I've had a few too yeah. where maybe the medical condition is not as severe, but sometimes their medical condition may require that they be on a certain type mm-hmm. of medication that mm-hmm. we know is teratogenic that That's could cause true. birth defects mm-hmm. in the pregnancy. Um, so I've had that one um, come up before. Or there are some very interesting medical conditions where as women, we can be born without a mm-hmm. uterus um, at all. There is no uterus. Or sometimes our patients have had a hysterectomy and and then want to be able to have um, a baby afterwards. So I think those are some of the other medical conditions that um, that I can think of off the top of my head that I've treated um, for gestational surrogacy. So. Um, and then I think probably some of the other ones too um, would be where maybe a same sex uh, male couple would need to use a gestational um, carrier. Or if you um, have a same sex um, lesbian couple where one of them will use the eggs and the other one will carry. Um, so we call that reciprocal IVF, mm-hmm. but in some ways that is using a gestational carrier too, but um, just usually a little bit less paperwork involved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, th- those are some of the other things as well. So yeah. Um, okay. And then for some of the people who've maybe tried to get pregnant and they're struggling, I think this is an important thing to point out um, because just because you're struggling to get pregnant doesn't mean that a gestational carrier is the answer. So I don't know if you've had this happen before, but this even happened recently. I had a patient, she had been struggling to get pregnant and she said, look, if we need to use a gestational carrier, I'm okay with that. But here's the thing. That wasn't the problem. Mm -hmm. She was doing IVF and she was making abnormal embryos Mm -hmm. every single time. And so in that case, I'm like, you really don't need a gestational carrier. You have a beautiful uterus. It can be a great home for a baby. In your case, you really need an egg donor to be able to help you produce normal embryos, which then can be placed in your uterus. Your problem isn't necessarily that the uterus is not a good home for the baby. Have you seen that come up Absolutely. too? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that's a really common conversation yeah. that we have. Sometimes we don't know. At yes. Least that's true. Patient, yeah. It was clear. She yeah. wasn't making normal genetic that's true. embryos. That's yeah. A conversation that comes up a yeah. lot with fertility and infertility and going through treatment processes there's really only a couple options. Is it the eggs mm-hmm. and or the sperm mm-hmm. or is it the environment, the uterus? Mm-hmm. And often we change the eggs. We mm-hmm. even change the sperm sometimes, but we're still getting an outcome that's not desirable. And then we suspect the uterus. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, absolutely. I've had that where, um, mm-hmm. you know, we're suspicious that mm-hmm. it's actually, maybe she has, you know, eggs that are not good quality and it's obviously happening and same thing. We're like, Oh, let's mm-hmm. use a gestational care. I'm like, I'm not sure it's going to fix the problem. I yeah. think it's the eggs, you mm-hmm. know, but you often don't know. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But there can definitely be plenty of things. Um, Sometimes I've seen women who have um, a very large number or large size of fibroids. Maybe they've even had fibroids Mm -hmm. removed before and they all came back or they have um, great amounts of scar tissue in the uterus. Sometimes you can have immunologic reasons why you're either miscarrying or having implantation difficulties. Um, So I think there are a number of things that sometimes we do recognize and say, you know what? it looks like we are going to need a gestational carrier in, in those cases. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say in that scenario, really common ones that I see, and mm-hmm. I think we've talked about this before, that we really need your lining to get nice and thick in yes. order to be able to That's receive true. an embryo and implant. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, there are certain women where their lining just will not grow thick enough. Mm-hmm. And I'm very strict about lining. Mm-hmm. I will not um, risk doing a transfer with thin lining because there's mm-hmm. actually some pretty good data to mm-hmm. show that you can have abnormal results in the pregnancy and the mm-hmm. way the placenta develops, putting the baby at risk mm-hmm. and causing a myriad of complications. So I just don't do it. And yeah. so when I can't get someone's lining to develop, I'm mm-hmm. always talking about mm-hmm. surrogates, gestational carriers, because mm-hmm. that really is the fix. If your lining isn't going to get past a certain point, mm-hmm. we can try mm-hmm. every medication that's out there, every supplement to try and get it to grow. But often it's just something intrinsically wrong with the lining and mm-hmm. sometimes it's that it's thin sometimes it's thin and there could be liquid or fluid in the mm-hmm. lining that continues to persistently be there mm-hmm. we see this a lot when someone's had a prior c-section yeah. and the c-section makes a little scar in your uterus where you had it 
sewn up mm-hmm. and then that scar just for some reason releases fluid that goes and seeps back down into the cavity and we just can't seem to get it to go away that's a really common one that I've seen happen yeah I have actually had some interesting conversations with OBGYNs recently because it does seem to me and I think actually we've seen some together it seems like we're seeing more of that over time it's called an ismocele where you get a little collection of fluid where the c-section scar was that can affect pregnancy implantation and can increase risk for miscarriage And, you know, I used to hardly ever see it. Now I'm seeing it more commonly. And what's interesting when you talk to OBGYNs is a lot of them did change the way they closed during a C-section. So I'm really old. So back when I used to do C-sections, you had to close the incision in two separate layers. And we did something called embrocation, which was this way of really building up and bringing back together those layers. But there were studies that came out later that said, maybe you don't really need to do that. And so a lot of modern OBGYNs do a single layer closure on the C-section incision um, for the uterine wall. And the studies that said, oh, it's fine, right? But here's the thing about studies. Sometimes they're not great at being able to discern very small changes. So it could be that only a very small women are affected by this change and it may not show up in a study. Mm -hmm. And so this is a discussion that we've been having, I think, in my field is, is that something that needs to be reconsidered? Should we maybe go back to the old way of closing in two layers? Um, because maybe for some women, that is not allowing the C-section scar to um, heal appropriately or properly. So, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Another sort of example that you reminded me of yeah. that I've seen, and again, <clears throat> this is not based on the data, the literature out there, but just anecdotal what I've encountered mm-hmm. and um, going looking at a lot of different IVF cycles mm-hmm. is that Occasionally, when someone has an IUD placed Mm -hmm. and then we pull the IUD, Mm -hmm. their lining will not develop Mm -hmm. and get thick. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, there are millions of women out there Mm -hmm. that get IUDs placed, pull them out pregnant the very next cycle, Mm -hmm. clearly don't have anything wrong with their lining. Mm -hmm. But there is, there must be some subset Mm -hmm. of women because they're able to get pregnant, Mm -hmm. proliferate their lining fine, and then get an IUD placed. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's something about the timing of the IUD placement? Mm-hmm. Is it that it's maybe being placed immediately postpartum mm-hmm. or, you know, I don't know what it okay. is, but Interesting. we've yeah. seen this. And okay. the reason why it actually came up uh-huh. is because our, we would screen all of our gestational carriers, our surrogates. We go mm-hmm. through a really strict medical history make sure we think they're going to be good mm-hmm. surrogates to carry babies. And we also look at their lining. Mm-hmm. And people mm-hmm. who had an IUD in place, we would have them pull it yeah. and we would do an ultrasound to look at their mm-hmm. lining mid cycle. Mm-hmm. And we would find that sometimes mm-hmm. their lining just does not get thick wow. and, it, and okay. could not explain it. Yeah. Right? Can't yeah. explain that. And yeah. they're not women that are trying to get pregnant on their own right. anymore. So they don't worry about their lining. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and it could be too, baby. It needs more time to wear mm-hmm. off than previously what we yeah. thought. So that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. But mm-hmm. again, no, no studies about that. doesn't show that yeah. something that would, and I love IUDs. I'm not saying don't yes, IUDs. Yeah. <laughs> just in, yeah. just out of curiosity, did it matter what type of IUD? Was it like a progestin IUD? Okay, that's what yeah, I figured. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, and then you kind of were starting to bring up, I think, gestational carrier um, screening. So first of all, once you've identified that you need a gestational carrier, you have to figure out how do you find a gestational carrier? They're hard to find, right? So where would you usually tell somebody to start? Agencies. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of agencies that we recommend. Mm -hmm. And agencies are nice because they do a lot of the screening for you. Mm -hmm. They'll send you basically a packet about the surrogate that potentially is available, maybe even a couple of them to choose from. And then once the surrogacy agency and the patient like one, then we review their medical history Mm -hmm. um, and criteria and all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that would be what's called um, like an unknown surrogate, someone that you don't know. You can also always consider using a known surrogate or a known gestational carrier, someone that may be related to you or a close friend. Um, And so we have, I have had people carry for their sisters and things like that. Which I always think it's so sweet because I remember you saying you would carry for your sister. Definitely. I I just was always so stressed out during pregnancy. I'm like, I love my sister, but I think she and I both are like, just, we're like, no, thank you. (laughs) 
Um, but, um, but I think this brings up a good point too, when it comes to us screening a gestational carrier for our patients, we understand that there is so much time and emotion and cost and everything that goes into the process that we are focused on what is going to give us the highest chances of you getting to bring home a baby from this process. And because of that, we're pretty strict on who we let somebody use as a gestational carrier. And I think that can sometimes be frustrating for the patient and frustrating for the agency because look, the agency just wants us to sign off on anybody, right? Because that's for them. They're going to make money off of that. They're doing well, you know. And so I've definitely felt pressure before from agencies, Mm -hmm. almost trying to make me feel like, well, no other doctor is as strict as you are. And then I ask the other doctors, they're like, no, of course we are. No, but you know, I, cause then I start to doubt myself and I'm asking the other doctors, would you accept this patient? They're like, absolutely not. Don't let this agency try to pressure you into using a carrier who is not a good candidate. Right. And Mm -hmm. it comes down, you know, for our listeners out there that maybe you're considering using a surrogate, it comes down to the safety of the surrogate and the baby that they're going to carry. Mm -hmm. And when you go through a surrogacy pregnancy, obviously you've already been through IVF and probably even a lot of fertility treatment. The last thing in the world that you would want to happen is a negative, dangerous outcome for your baby that Mm -hmm. you work so hard. So the reason we have these really strict guidelines is so that something bad doesn't happen. That's the only reason. Yes, absolutely. Um, And then I will say too, sometimes there's some state regulations involved. So for example, up until just a few years ago, it wasn't even legal to use a gestational carrier in New York, for example. And that always surprised me because New York always strikes me as a state that's very progressive and modern and everything. So the fact that it wasn't even until recent that you could use a gestational carrier always surprises me. In Texas, we've been able to use gestational carriers for a long time, but we do have restrictions such as the fact that you have to have a legitimate medical diagnosis to use a gestational carrier. And the gestational carrier has to have given birth herself before, which I think Mm -hmm. is interesting, right? Yeah. Um, And you kind of think, why would that be? And the legal standpoint is that the gestational carrier needs to give consent. But they feel like in the state of Texas, you cannot truly give consent unless you understand and know what pregnancy and childbirth is like already. And so I think that's kind of an interesting restriction. So I've had a patient before that wanted to use her sister as her gestational carrier, but her sister had not had a baby before. And so we were not able to do that. So she had actually planned to go to Canada um, because Mm -hmm. she said in Canada, they didn't have that restriction. And then she ended up not doing it anyway. She ultimately ended up being able to carry because her medical condition um, resolved. Um, But that was kind of an interesting process just to kind of learn about the legalities of, of that. Yeah. And you kind of wonder too, for the other restriction of medical diagnosis, Mm -hmm. how can, how far can you stretch something to kind of fit that criteria? I'm always curious what people are putting into that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, So let's just talk about, because I know we like to, of course, review the patient's medical records Mm -hmm. when somebody wants to be a gestational carrier. And so what are some of the things that you would like to see in the medical records? And what are some things that would be total deal breakers for you? Probably the most important things that I look at is mm-hmm. their prior pregnancy mm-hmm. records um, and how they did during that pregnancy and how the deliveries went. Mm-hmm. That is what I really pan through. And all the time, agencies send over packets and yeah. they don't have the delivery no, mm-hmm. they don't have the prior pregnancy. So I'm like, no, I need every single pregnancy's mm-hmm. records. So um, really, really important to see how they did with their pregnancy. Was Mm -hmm. the baby healthy, growing appropriately? Were they healthy? Did Mm -hmm. they deliver at term? How did they deliver? Did they have a C-section or a vaginal delivery? Did they have complications during the pregnancy or during the delivery? All Mm -hmm. that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um, And in terms of deal breakers, let's see some of my absolute contraindications. Um, So, you know, really severe complications during a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you can have varying degrees of hypertension during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. One of those is is preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia, having even eclampsia, which is seizures during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So I would say any forms of those, you know, severe preeclampsia is an absolute contraindication for Mm -hmm. me. Um, You know, having a very 
a preterm delivery, yeah. a very early preterm delivery. Um, and certainly if it wasn't, you know, something that was indicated, mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, deal breakers. And then it's a lot about their pre-existing health as well. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. can happen. I'm actually pretty strict about postpartum hemorrhage as well. Mm -hmm. They have deliveries where they bleed really heavily afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge risk um, yeah. to reoccur again with mm -hmm. another pregnancy. And we don't want to put these women at risk. Yeah. So. Certainly maybe age and body mm -hmm. mass index. Um, what about C-sections? This is one that I see come up a lot. Do you have a certain number of C-sections, prior C-sections, where you say that's just too many? Um, so four was mm -hmm. what like our criteria that I kind of trained mm -hmm. with for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, you know, I think that it is something that also needs to be discussed with the yeah. surrogate as well. Yeah. Because it, it, I think it depends on their comfort level and really knowing. Mm -hmm. um, and I've even had questions like, do you think that my surrogate could have a vaginal delivery after having a C-section? Mm -hmm. And like sometimes patients just really aren't on the same page. They don't yeah. understand. Like if your mm -hmm. surrogate has had two prior C-sections, mm -hmm. they're going to have a C-section with this delivery. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty rare that someone's going to do what we call vaginal birth after cesarean after two C-sections. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, stuff like that. I mean, mm -hmm. you really have to kind of cover all your bases and make sure the patient really understands the magnitude mm -hmm. of your surrogate yeah. delivered via C-section three children, mm -hmm. you're going to have a C-section. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think it kind of brings to mind too, um, some of the complexities in terms of legality of gestational mm -hmm. carriers. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple of different things and it's state by state as when the baby's born, who is the mother at that point. Mm -hmm. And that, so there's some states where you can have an agreement set out ahead of time. There's other states where you technically have to adopt the baby from the gestational carrier. And I mean, it can be very complicated. So I know that as part of the gestational carrier process, we have a third party nurse who coordinates the whole thing. And she makes sure that everybody involved has gone through a checklist of items, including having counseling done, including having certain labs and testing done, medical record review, and importantly, legal. You have to have decided these things ahead of time as to how many embryos are going to get put in. And even if you only put one in, which you should do in most cases, what if it splits into two? And what if they find a birth defect? And let's say the intended parents would want to have a termination, but then the gestational carrier says, no, I'm against that. And I mean, these are very complex situations that really need to be hammered out ahead of time because you don't want to be figuring this out in the middle of a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's always the things that you think will never happen. Yeah, and sure. Ha I mean, yeah. um, it's just really rare things always pop up. Yeah. Or yeah. even that, you know, let's say the gestational carrier had a prior vaginal delivery. Now she's in labor as mm -hmm. a gestational carrier and the baby's heart rate is starting to drop. And let's say the doctor says we need to do a C-section and the gestational carrier says, no, I don't want a C-section. I want a vaginal delivery. And then the intended parents are worried because they say, well, we, we want you to have a seat. You know, these, again, are very complex issues um, and could I can maybe understand this both sides to it, but it, you've really got to get it all set out from the very beginning so that you don't run into issues or problems later because it is very complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I also wanted to talk about just kind of knowing the intention of using a gestational carrier. So there's kind of two situations. One is a patient comes in and they know from day one, I need to use a gestational carrier. I would say in that respect, it's a lot easier because we know we need to do special infectious disease screening mm -hmm. ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And the reason is the government, the FDA, they get involved um, with these types of cases and they almost view it as donating an organ. Okay. And so for a process like that, the government wants to make sure that all parties involved are as protected and safe as possible. And so if we have a patient that is um, going to use a gestational carrier, then she and if she has a male partner, she and her partner would have to undergo special lab testing, FDA lab testing. They need to undergo a special questionnaire. They need to have special physical exams and everything. And this has to be done right around the time of embryo creation so that when we have embryos, we can later show the gestational carrier, hey, They've, we've, they've been tested and screened for everything. This should be safe for you to have an embryo implanted, right? Absolutely. But yeah. then what happens if we didn't know the patient was going to use a gestational carrier? Mm -hmm. Let's say the patient 
did IVF. Let's say she made three embryos and they put two in, they weren't working. And we found out she had some reason that couldn't be corrected. She's got one embryo left. Can she still use a gestational carrier? Yes. Okay. Yes. How so we yeah. have been, um, we usually have a waiver to sign basically saying yeah. at the time of um, embryo creation and gestational carriers counseled and understands that as well. Pretty much always we do have infectious disease testing yeah. that's done prior to embryo creation. It's not just not this very specialized panel of yeah. specifics that are done, but it would be an FDA waiver. So, you know, signature. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, when these cases come up, I do think sometimes it could make finding a gestational care a little bit more difficult if you have to say, well, these were not, mm -hmm. these embryos were not screened properly at that time because mm -hmm. we didn't know we would mm -hmm. need to use a gestational carrier. But I think the reassuring thing is there's been no reports ever of a patient getting any kind of infection from an embryo. Right. being placed. And this so, a theoretical risk, yeah, so yeah. So I think it's more well. just, we have to check all the boxes mm -hmm. to follow, you know, what the government is trying to do, which is of course trying mm -hmm. to keep people as safe as possible. And, and so I think it's reasonable. Um, and then I went to touch on cost. Okay. So that's probably the biggest question that people will come to ask me. And here's the hard part. I don't have like a single number to give. Yeah, um, this is the cost, yeah. you know? Um, I think it's the, the part that's easy for me to share is our cost. Right. And really our cost is not that high. We're just talking about the cost of an embryo transfer and the cost of a, a nurse coordinating the cycle. And so that is a pretty small cost overall. But the large cost is compensating the gestational carrier to undergo um, all of that and also having the donor agency coordinate and then the cost of legal and counseling and all of those things. And because there's so many different parties involved, I just don't have a number. Do you have a number? I usually tell people 200,000. 200,000. Oh my yeah, gosh. And when wow. I, uh, and this is coming from, I mean, we, I was up in the Northeast for a, you know, a mm -hmm. long time. And so we would say like kind of all in mm -hmm. when, the, when you're using an agency, this is not for a new mm -hmm. gestational carrier. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I would see a cost around that. I it do used to be like a hundred thousand. Yeah. I was going like, to say like, in I, Texas, mm -hmm. I would say yeah. maybe more a hundred thousand yeah. would have been my best guess, but again, yeah. I don't have the actual numbers. Mm -hmm. So maybe too, if we have patients who are listening, who've used mm -hmm. a gestational care, maybe it would be kind of you to share your mm -hmm. costs just so patients can have a better understanding of what it is. Um, but you know, I think maybe it would be nice if we could just have somebody kind of call and just each part and just say, give me a mm -hmm. rough estimate, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's going to vary by, by individual, mm -hmm. but I um, wonder if Julie has a good estimate, at least in Texas. I too. know yeah. nurse Julie's always mm -hmm. so good with the finances. Yeah. She probably does. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Should we wrap it up for the week? Yes. Okay. Great good. Week. Thanks for listening y'all. Thank you guys. Bye.